Let's get started. Uh, this next talk is going to be about uh, how pseudo entanglement ain't cheap. Um, this is a work of Daniel Liang, Sabi Grewal, Vishnu Ayer, and William Kreshmer. Um, Daniel, please uh, start. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, like Dr. Shida said, this is a call to entanglement ain't cheap with uh, my wonderful co-authors, uh, Sabir Grewal, who is not here at the moment, but attending the conference, Vishnu Iyer, who's sitting in the audience right there, and William Kretschmer, who could not make it. Um, yeah. So what is pseudo-entanglement? Um, so it's a concept that was introduced by the set of authors uh, quite recently. And basically the idea, this is not the formal definition, but uh, I'll take two sets of quantum states, call it psi sub k and phi sub k. And we're gonna say both states can be synthesized efficiently. And one has large entanglement and one has small entanglement. And, but you cannot computationally distinguish these two states. So I'll give you just like copies of one of these two sets of states. I promise you it's either psi k or phi k and you can't uh, tell which one it is, and yet somehow one is large entanglement and one is small entanglement. And the idea is that the small entanglement state is like pseudo entangled. It seems like a highly entangled state, and yet it is not. Um, and then the synthesized efficiently part is just, you know, maybe it can be used for cryptographic means similar to say a, a pseudo random state, which I will introduce uh, in a bit. I will note that there's an alternative definition of pseudo entanglement introduced by uh, these set of authors. Um, I won't go into it. It's like slightly different and we don't say anything about that. If you have, if you've heard of that, like we don't say anything about that. Um, okay, so cheap relative to what? So the idea of a pseudo random state, um, if you've been to the plenaries, you've probably heard enough about this, but it was introduced by Ji Liu and Song in 2018. And it's a very similar idea as pseudo entanglement, but now we only have one set of states. Um, just call it psi k. Uh, psi k has to be, be able to be synthesized efficiently. Um, and you can't distinguish it from a Haar random state now. So rather than two sets of states you can't distinguish, you just distinguish it from a very you know, naturally random state. Um, and the focus of this talk is, you know, is constructing pseudo entanglement easier than constructing pseudo random states. Um, pseudo random states are, as you want to do Tomoyuki's talk, you know, useful for a wide variety of things. Um, and the, the idea is, you know, can you somehow show that pseudo entanglement might be easier than the other? We currently, unlike the graph that he showed, we don't have, um, well, okay, I think there's actually recent work, but um, we don't really have good uh, relationships between the two classes. Um, yeah, I think we now have something about the alternative definition of pseudo entanglement and EFI pairs coming out of Okinawa, but this definition that was introduced by Boland et al, I don't think there's actually any formal relationships. So the question is, can we somehow show that one is easier than the other? And so what was already known, um, so both can be constructed using one-way functions. Um, and for the lower bounds, really not too much. This isn't too surprising. If you could show that they didn't exist, then you would show that one-way functions don't exist. We don't expect to do that. But um, something that we can show is that pseudo-random states require a, like a linear number of non-Clifford gates. So if let's say you're in the Clifford plus T basis, then you know you need at least a linear number of non-Clifford gates to create a pseudo-random state. And the point of this work is to show that the same lower bound holds for non-Clifford gates uh, for pseudo-entanglement. So um, you, at least in terms of the Clifford plus T basis, you currently don't expect to be able to produce pseudo entanglement using less non-Cliffordness like as a resource than pseudo random states. Does that make sense to everyone? So what are non-Clifford gates and why do we care? Um, this should be review for most of you, but the Clifford set and the Clifford gates are the following set of unitaries. You've probably seen the Hadamard and CNOT. You've, um, you've definitely seen those. You probably have seen the phase gate. And a non-Clifford gate is anything that is not generated by the set of unitaries. Um, the classical example is the T gate, which is the following. Um, it's not actually that important to know the details of it, but um, just know that every time you apply a non-Clifford gate, it adds complexity to the stabilizer states. Um, by adding a, just a singular non-Clifford gate, you can create a universal gate set. 
So basically, every time you add non-Clifford gifts, you you add like complexity, um, and like the amount of expressibility you have. Um, this is also related to things like magic state factories and fault tolerant computation. And the sort of the original reason we were looking at this problem is that there was thought to be a relationship with ADS CFT. Um, this is so Tony Metger approached us with this problem. It turns out that both the conjecture that they had and the relationship that they were thinking about are not true, but we thank him nevertheless for giving us this problem. Okay, so what's the main idea? Um, so if you know things about learning stabilizer states, you might know that in 2017, Montanaro gave this algorithm to uh, find the description of an unknown stabilizer state, given copies of the state. Um, if you don't know what a stabilizer state is, it's basically a state produced by zero non clifford gates. Um, and that's the following runtimes. It's not so important. Um, and then there was another very old result that says, given the description of a stabilizer state, you can compute its entanglement exactly across any cut. So in the first uh, part, you can get the description. In the second part, given the description, you can find out the entanglement across any set of qubits. So the algorithm is pretty straightforward. Um, and the idea is basically as follows. Um, or you can think about it like this. There's a set of local Clifford operations you can apply across the cut. So let's say Alice and Bob each apply a Clifford circuit. And what you end up getting is this uh, state that looks like this. So you have a psi, phi A and phi B that are unentangled from Alice and Bob. And you have this shared phi AB, and it turns out to be maximally entangled. Um, it has to basically be a Bell pair across every qubit in phi in those shared registers. Um, and this is a maximally entangled state, and you can get the entanglement from that directly just by counting how many qubits you have. Um, and basically, the improvements that we show is that uh, one, there is a previous result that um, given a state that's produced by a bounded number of non Clifford gates that you could find what's called like the stabilizer information, so to speak. So you don't get a complete description of the state, but you get some important information related to stabilizer states. Um, another thing that you can do is you can find an approximation of the entanglement given this stabilizer information. So basically it's sort of generalizing those previous results we saw to when you apply some amount of non-cliffordness to it. Um, and I'll basically go into detail on how we generalize that. Um, but the main idea that you want to take away is that we have a similar picture now to before. We have these local Clifford unitaries. And now we have this shared psi AB where we basically just don't know what that state is. It could be maximally entangled. It could be completely unentangled. Um, we basically just punt on those qubits and say that you know, that's basically where this K error comes from. And the rest of the uh, registers look exactly the same. We know exactly what the entanglement is for those qubits. So the high level idea is that every time you apply a Clifford gate or non Clifford gate, I should say, you lose one bit of information about your state and that just creates the error that we see. Okay, so what exactly is stabilizer information? Um, so hopefully this is also a review for you, but there are these matrices called the poly matrices. Um, so a poly matrix stabilizes a state if it's a one eigenvector or eigenstate of that poly matrix. And you can th think about this as a set of constraints. So if I define stab of psi to be the poly matrices such that um, the poly matrix is a, like stabilizes that state, um, it sort of constrains your state in a certain number of ways based, because it has to be like an eigenvector. Um, so if you have a ton of constraints, the maximal number is two to the n, then you completely constrain your state and we call that a stabilizer state. Um, and basically every non clifford gate you apply reduces or can reduce the number of constraints you have. Um, by this explicit amount, but basically because we're reducing the number of constraints, that's why there ends up being a larger and larger register qubit or set of qubits that we just don't know anything about. Um, but it does so basically in a very natural way, which is why we can actually still make progress. Um, so here's an example um, of how this works. So 
Let's say I say this poly matrix Z I I I I I is a stabilizer of psi, then psi has to take the following form. Um, so basically, if you take Z I I I I and you multiply it by state psi, this creates a constraint on your state. I uh, claim that this constraint is satisfied by any state with the following. Do I have a, oh, I do. Yeah, so basically it has to be zero in the first qubit and then some arbitrary state over here. Um, similarly, if uh, I have X, I, 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 um, then it has to be a plus state on the first qubit followed by some arbitrary state. Um, so that's an example of like how these constraints work. Um, you can do a similar thing with like the last qubit, for instance. Um, so these are like uh, very simple examples and they uh, demonstrate actually how we can show that certain qubits are unentangled. So for instance, if um, this qubit is unentangled with this psi prime over here, um, a more complicated example would be, let's say that uh, XII, XII, and ZII, ZII are both stabilizers of your state, then I claim that the first and fourth qubit must form an EPR pair. Um, this is probably hard to see if you're not familiar with stabilizer states and things like that, but um, this is more or less um, like how the result of Fatal et al. that I cited way, way back from 2004 works. Um, another example would be this set of stabilizer or this set of poly matrices of stabilizers means that the first and the sixth qubit form like this maximally entangled state. So that's just to gain some intuition about how this all works. Uh, so what is the main theorem? So let A and B be the number of qubits that Alice and Bob have. And let stab sub A be the subset, sorry for the notation by the way, um, let stab sub A be the subset of stab psi. So stab psi is the set of stabilizers of your state um, that only act on Alice's qubits. So for instance, if uh, the first three qubits are Alice's, then ZII and XII would be like in stab sub Alice. Um, and let's say, and these guys would be in Bob's because it only acts non-trivially on the last three qubits. Um, and then let's say these guys would not be in either of the sets because they act non-trivially on both the first and the last three qubits. Okay. So with that out of the way, let me just say that these things can be found efficiently and that will be important for our algorithm. But the idea is that the uh, entanglement, so basically like the you know, von Neumann entropy of the reduced density matrix, I hope that's all familiar for you guys but it's basically upper and lower bounded by these two quantities. So the number of qubits minus the, basically the number of things in this set, stabs of A, um, there's a, so the bound might be somewhat esoteric. Um, I'll get, explain more about how we get the actual result we want later. And I'll just uh, give a shout out to Gu, Olivero, and Leone. I think they're in the audience, or at least, I think Lorenzo's over there. Um, they have a similar result. and. Um, I think they have a different proof, so check it out. Um, so anyway, the point is that if I take the upper and lower bounds and I subtract the upper from the lower, this is basically how, just how much error is in our bounds. And it turns out you just do some quick algebra, you get this quantity. And if you recall that I showed you way back that the number of non clipper gates implies a lower bound on this quantity right here. So if you plug that in, you just end up with a bound of 2K. And naturally you'll just output the thing in the middle of, of your bounds as your estimate. So upper minus lower divided by two, the arithmetic mean. And therefore, sorry, um, if you just do that, then you're gonna be within K always of the true uh, entanglement. So that's how we get our K approximate error. Um, I mentioned before that we only approximately learn this so-called stabilizer information. Um, turns out it's not a big deal. Um, so formally, we learn the stabilizer information of a state that is close to the true state that we have. Um, and then there's a result by um, Fan and Odenart that shows that if your state is close, then the entanglement is close. 
Um, this is like the actual quantitative bounds that you get. And so what ends up happening, I'll give you the actual details is, so to learn entanglement to error K of a state produced uh, by like at most K non Clifford gates, you can learn it to error K plus O of epsilon N in this many samples and this much time. So like a linear in N number of samples and a cubic amount of time, the cube just comes from that Gaussian elimination process I talked about earlier. Um, otherwise it's under certain regimes, you could probably find it faster using like some fast matrix multiplication algorithm. But um, that's just why I brought it up. And I just wanna add at the very end that there's sort of a clever trick that we use to uh, get rid of all the error besides the inherent uh, error from not knowing what those qubits are about. So we basically get rid of the, uh, this epsilon n part. Um, and now the number of samples is n cubed and the time is n to the fifth. Um, and basically the idea is that there's two sources of error and they cannot be satisfied simultaneously. Um, so this is not actually how it works, but this is the way you should think about it is that there's like an inherent K minus one error in the worst case. And then there's either a plus one error from like the inherent from going back from this step. So there's, there's either like a plus one error from this step or there's this O of epsilon N error we get from only learning the information approximately, but they both can't happen at the same time. Um, so what ends up happening is that if you set epsilon to be O of one over N, then both of these are just plus one, give or take. So K minus one plus one, you just get K. Um, so yeah, so basically we can, like I said, get rid of this plus O of epsilon N error by just doing some clever parameter counting and knowing that this bounds are not saturated at the same time. Um, so what are the conclusions? Uh, we can estimate the entanglement of states produced by some, not too many Clifford gates, like a linear number basically. Um, and the corollary of this is that around omega K non Clifford gates are needed to create an entanglement gap of K. Um, if you recall, we were originally trying to figure out how many non Clifford gates we need to create pseudo entanglement. And the largest amount of pseudo entanglement you can create is linear. Um, so, oh yeah. So yeah, when the maximum entanglement gap is linear, then you know this matches the pseudo random state lower bound, um, which is the goal. And also this is tight up the polylogarithmic factors. Um, so if you assume the existence of linear time quantum secure one-way functions, then um, Fermi Ma has an upcoming result that can produce pseudo entanglement states in uh, like linear times polylog time. Um, so this is uh, tight. And this, you might be wondering about this assumption. So I guess the point is that um, we might not, you know, this might not be like the best assumption to rely on, but the idea is that if you could improve our result, then this would discredit the existence of linear time quantum secure one-way functions. And we don't expect our techniques to be able to do such a thing because why would stabilizer states and things like that disprove such a strong, um, you know, statement. And um, I was told I should do this, but uh, I'm on, I'm, I'll be on the job market soon looking for a PhD or postdoc um, or faculty position. So uh, this is my contact info and thank you. Yeah. Great talk, thank you. Um, any questions from the audience? So yeah, this result only works for uh, pure states, I guess, right? Because I think David and Manuel, they consider something more general that's mixed states that are pseudo entangled. Uh, yes, I think the, um, I think the Bull and all result is only for pure states as well. So we only looked at pure states as well. Other questions? We have a bit of time. So while you think about any questions you may have, let me ask a couple of questions. Um, how, uh, 
So you said something about pseudo entanglement relating to uh, quantum cryptographic primitives like the EFI pairs and commitments. Um, okay. Could, could you, you said that there was maybe some recent results showing something like that? Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, maybe the authors are here, but I think this is not the Boland et al. definition from what I recall. There's the other definition from Arnon, Friedman, and Vidic. Um, Would you, uh, what is the other definition? Like, how does it differ from that? Right, right. Um, okay, so the one difference is that only, I believe, the small entanglement state has to be prepared efficiently. And um, also the entanglement is only over a fixed cut, but now the, um, what the definition of entanglement changes. So in this um, A, B, V definition, the low entanglement state has to be prepared using a small number of bell pairs. So it's like the synthesis cost of entanglement and the high entanglement state has to have, you need to be able to synthesize a lot of bell pairs from that state. So given copies of that state, can you create, how many bell pairs can you create out of it? Um, so yeah, um, the, def the difference is- not known to be equal. It feels like they should maybe be, it seems similar to me, but- Oh, that might be a new paper for you. <laughs> um, anyways, I think the result, um, says that pseudo entanglement implies, or EFI pairs imp implies pseudo entanglement of this ABV kind. I see. So it says that um, that kind of pseudo entanglement has to exist if EFI pairs also exist. And, um, you know, EFI pairs have to exist if all the other pseudo random states exist and things like that. So um, it's, I don't know necessarily if that definition of a pseudo entanglement implies all the things like bit commitments and things like that. Um, but the point is that it's like some baseline assumption that you can make. Okay, so follow up question. Mm -hmm. Does your result say something about the complexity of synthesizing uh, cryptographically useful primitives like commitments? Um, not in a, not that I'm aware of, unfortunately, yeah. So that's another paper for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any other questions? Okay, let's thank the speaker again.